Hello Dudley Humans, welcome back to the channel. In today's video where we will be talking about frismide versus the kidneys versus the heart failure. So this was a requested topic and thank you so much for the request. I'm always open to those. And I know that in clinical practice that we doctors in general do find this to be a tricky area. But as a nephrologist, I'm always dancing with this problem. And so what I want to do in this video is to tell you how I approach this, what I actually do in my clinical practice so that hopefully that helps you the next time that you see this clinical scenario. But a quick disclaimer, I am going to share how I think about this, but of course this random YouTube video cannot be responsible for your patient's care. So I hope this is helpful, but if in doubt, please call upon your friendly nephrologist to help in these scenarios. Don't be suing me and let's proceed. So say you have a patient with fluid overload due to heart failure, but they also have CKD. And maybe they have fairly advanced CKD to the point where it makes you nervous that if you use frismide, it might worsen their renal function. And your nervousness is not unfounded. It is absolutely possible to overdo things with frismide and cause an acute kidney injury. And we are taught this so early in our careers. Whenever we see an acute kidney injury, we are scoring that frismide off the chart. And so this idea that frismide is bad or even contraindicated in renal failure is cemented in our minds. But the truth is that we nephrologists love frismide in the right context. We absolutely love it. It is one of the most brilliant drugs on planet Earth and we use it often and we use decent doses. Now that's not to say that we don't acknowledge that frismide can absolutely dehydrate people and when it does, it can cause acute renal impairment. It absolutely can. But the key to using frismide in people with renal impairment is to understand that there is a tipping point beyond which the kidney will suffer. But up until that tipping point, frismide can be used when needed with good effect. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how I determine where that tipping point is so that I can use frismide for benefit rather than harm. And so hopefully you can do this too. But before we do that, there's a couple of important concepts to point out when it comes to the relationship between the heart and the kidneys. The first thing to say is that ultimately, if someone has heart failure and acute pulmonary edema and they cannot breathe, then we're gonna be reaching for that frismide every single time. And the kidneys, even if they did take a hit, we need to be using the frismide. But in less acute situations, it's important to appreciate that the heart and kidneys are in a circuit and kidneys can be affected by both sides of the circuit. So if you have a low cardiac output, that can lead to reduced GFR because the kidney feels like it's not getting enough blood supply and it will reduce its function and activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And its main goal is to increase the blood volume and restore perfusion to the other organs. So the kidney sort of sacrifices its GFR to do that. And so the GFR can go down. But equally on the venous side of the circuit, if blood flow is congested because it's having trouble making its way back to the heart and therefore the abdominal vein pressures are high, the kidney can also suffer in that situation because it's all congested and the kidney doesn't really like that. So the kidney is impacted by both sides of the circuit, by reduced cardiac output, sure, but also by venous congestion. And so if the renal impairment is due to these hemodynamic aspects, then if we improve these, we might also improve kidney function. And we can see how in some scenarios, frismide would be great for this. Offload the fluid, reduce the cardiac stretch. We got our Frank Starling situation sorted out, all better. The circuit starts to work better with less fluid on board. And that could be really good for our little kidneys. But what the kidneys wouldn't love is less blood supply or less cardiac output than they already have. In that scenario, if you give them frismide and drop their blood supply, they won't thank you. And so this brings us to the concept of intravascular blood volume. When you're prescribing frismide in this context where someone is fluid overloaded and they have renal impairment, in order to know if this is going to help or hinder the kidney function, we must have an appreciation of whether they have a high circulating blood volume or not. And so how would you know if someone has a high circulating blood volume? We got two things, their JVP 
and their blood pressure. So if you see someone with a big bouncy JVP that's elevated, provided that's not coming from tricuspid regurgitation or pericardial disease or some such, usually in the bog standard heart failure situation, if that JVP is elevated, it does signify a high blood volume. But sometimes the JVP can be difficult to pin down, right? Sometimes it can feel a little invisible. So another thing to take into consideration is their blood pressure. So if someone has a fairly normal or high blood pressure, they're unlikely to be intravascularly dry. So if you can't see the JVP, but you know the blood pressure is 130, 140, 160, we're gonna say they have a decent blood volume. So the key message here is that frusmide in the setting of heart failure and renal impairment is a good idea provided they have sufficient blood volume to use it, as determined by your incredible clinical skills. On the other hand, if someone's edematous, but they don't have a big juicy blood volume, maybe their JVP's at the clavicle, their blood pressure's in their boots, then giving that person frusmide could very much drop their renal function very quickly. So high blood volume, frusmide is likely to be tolerated, low blood volume, kidneys are very likely to struggle when frusmide is introduced. And that brings us to this concept of the tipping point. The tipping point is where we would expect frusmide to cause acute renal impairment. And it's basically the point where the person is dehydrated or has a low circulating blood volume. So like we mentioned, you might go to the bedside and find your patient is already at the tipping point or has already proceeded past the tipping point. They don't have enough blood volume, even if they look peripherally overloaded, if the fluid is not in the bloodstream, then the frusmide is not welcome. Frusmide would be a bad choice for this person. But even if they're not at the tipping point initially, once you start using frusmide and you are successfully diuresing them, you will edge closer and closer to this tipping point as you go. And so it's important to know where that tipping point is so that you can monitor them and you don't overshoot. And for this, we estimate their dry weight. The dry weight is basically their euvolemic weight. Anything lower than the dry weight will take us over the edge into the tipping point. But euvolemia, the kidneys love that. So the way that I estimate the patient's dry weight is by using the level of edema. So when it comes to edema, we don't wanna just say, oh, they've got some ankle edema and move on with our day. No, no, we want to find the level of edema. So if you find fluid at the ankles, you then proceed to the shins, behind the thighs, then the sacrum, then the thorax. You wanna find out how far this edema goes up the body. So significant edema below the knees, we're talking maybe one to two liters, depending on the severity. Above the knee might be three to four liters. At the sacrum could be five or six liters. Now, of course, this concept involves gravity. So I'm referring to an ambulant patient who can walk around. If you have a bed bound patient with their legs elevated for some reason all the time, they might have some sacral edema as opposed to lower limb edema. But for your ambulant patient, this is a good compass for how much additional fluid is on board. And we can estimate that in liters. And of course, one liter of fluid is equivalent to one kilogram. So we can adjust their base weight. But one thing to be aware of here when using edema to estimate dry weight is that we must be very cautious when it comes to venous insufficiency changes. So something that is super common as we get older, our veins don't bring blood back to the heart so well. And we have this dependent edema in the legs. So people wake up and they have skinny ankles. As they walk around all day, they develop ankle edema. And that is venous insufficiency. And it's accompanied by those telltale skin changes. So hemosiderin deposition, maybe even some varicosities that you can see in the lower limbs. And if you have edema due to venous insufficiency, it doesn't mean that you are systemically overloaded. And if you diarrhea someone with a bit of ankle edema due to venous insufficiency, but they've got a normal blood volume, you will absolutely dehydrate that person and reach that tipping point very quickly. So just be aware of that. If they have venous insufficiency, feel free to leave a little bit of ankle edema in play. You don't wanna get rid of all of the ankle edema and venous insufficiency with frusmide. It simply will not work and acute kidney injury is all but certain. And so venous insufficiency aside, I would weigh them 
find the level of edema, and then determine their estimated euvolemic weight using that as a guide, working towards this weight as we diuresis them. And we'll be aiming to take off 0.5 to 1 kilogram per day of fluid using Frismide, monitoring this weight daily and reassessing their clinical status as we go because we don't want to step past that tipping point. And of course, another piece of data that will tell you if you have gone over the tipping point is the blood test. If you're diuresing someone and everything's going well at 80 kilograms, then suddenly you get to 79 kilograms and the kidney function goes off, then that's a signal that we have reached our tipping point and we should cut back on our diuretics and aim for that sweet spot where the volume status and their renal function are both happy. We'll set that as their ideal weight moving forward. But something else to be aware of when using the renal function as a guide as to whether you've gone too far with your diuretics or not is to realize that in patients who are fluid overloaded, sometimes their kidney function can appear artificially better than their baseline. And when we get rid of the fluid, the kidney function can return to their baseline, but the trend might look as if the kidney function is getting worse when really there's nothing wrong at all. They're just traveling towards their baseline level of renal function. So it's key to know where that baseline renal function is normally for your patient when you're diuresing them so that you know what's okay versus what's going beyond the tipping point. So that was my take on how to think about frismide versus renal impairment versus heart failure. I really hope this helps your clinical practice. But of course, with these patients, I would always encourage you to involve your friendly nephrologist who can absolutely help to guide safe diuresis in patients with advanced renal impairment. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and maybe even say hello in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. And regardless, I hope to see you again soon with some more high yield learning. Bye!